Today, one out of every four Christian adults believes Jesus Christ could return in their lifetime. Why? Because Jesus promised, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Where does the Bible teach that a whole generation of believers around the world will be taken in mass into God's presence at the time of the rapture and that they will never know what it is to die physically. Today, we will take you step by step through what the Bible reveals will happen at the moment of the rapture and how this mighty act of power will lead the world into the future events the Bible predicts will happen in the last days. My guests are Dr. Ed Heinsen, Dean of the Rawlings School of Divinity and Distinguished Professor of Religion at Liberty University and has written over 40 books on prophecy and served as the editor of five study Bibles. Second, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary and is the author of 30 books on prophecy. And third, Dr. Ron Rhodes, who also teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary and is the author of 70 books on prophecy. We invite you to join us for the special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program, I'm John Ankerberg. Thanks for joining me today. You know, in the last 30 days, about eight and a half million of you have contacted us at our social media site, and about one third of all of you folks have asked questions about the very topic we're gonna to talk about today. It's the return of Jesus Christ and what's gonna to happen to world events here on earth. And so I've invited three of the very best scholars here in our country on biblical prophecy to lay out what the Bible clearly says. My guests are Dr. Ed Heinsen, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, and Dr. Ron Rhodes. And between them, these three guys have written 140 books on topics related to biblical prophecy. And guys, I'd like to begin today with one of the major passages in the Bible about Jesus' return, okay? Because folks at home, I want you to see these verses and see what the Bible says before we ever talk about them, all right? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18, the Apostle Paul wrote the church at Thessalonica and he said this. He says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Then he says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, Paul includes himself, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Dr. Ed Heinsen, explain the background of this passage to this wonderful church at Thessalonica. What did they know, and what were their questions, and what was Paul telling them? Paul came there on his second missionary journey. He only spent three weeks in Thessalonica preached the gospel, planted the church, and taught them Bible doctrine, including the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. And part of that was that Jesus was going to return for them. The questions were, what about the people who've died in the meantime? Have they missed out on the second coming? Uh, are they going to be disembodied spirits in eternity? Are they second-class citizens? Are they going to miss the great reunion of believers that's coming in the future? What about those that have died in the meantime What's going to happen to them in relation to us? Yeah. Mark, what was, what was he talking about? He says, I don't want you to be ignorant about those who are asleep. What does that mean? Well, a lot of people have mistakenly come up with the idea that it's talking about the soul, uh, that the soul is asleep, that the soul is kind of unconscious mm -hmm. uh, between the time you die and the time that the Lord comes. Uh, but there's a couple passages in Scripture, I think, that would tell us that the soul is not asleep during that interim period. 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, Paul says, I'd rather, it's better to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I mean, Philippians 1.23 says, I have the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is very much better. So when a, when a believer in Jesus Christ dies, the immaterial part of that person, the soul, the spirit, goes immediately to be with the Lord in conscious fellowship with Him. And sleep is talking about the body. Uh, the body is asleep. Uh, lying in the grave, they're awaiting uh, the coming of the Lord, awaiting the yeah, rapture. Yeah, saying the body's got a future. That's right. All right, now it says when that happens, those that sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. What's that all about? Well, at death, the Spirit goes immediately to heaven to be with the Lord. The body's in the grave, and the promise that Paul is giving here about the rapture is, at the time of the rapture, your spirit returns with the Lord Jesus from heaven, and the body is resurrected. So you have the uh, triumphal shout, the sound of the trumpet, uh, the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ rise and are reunited with their spirit that returns. Now, some people say, well, why do I need a body in all eternity? Because of the promise, Paul says here, of the resurrection of Jesus. He rose literally, bodily, physically. Therefore, we will, in the same way, rise literally, bodily, and physically. All right, and Mark, and then he comes up with this important phrase. This information, where did he get it? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Well, Paul got this information directly from the Lord. Um, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the, the truth of the rapture is called the mystery. Mm -hmm. So he received some of this by special revelation from the Lord, but also Jesus taught this as well when he was on earth. John 14. Uh, John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. Mm -hmm. So when he says, we say this by the word of the Lord, uh, Paul had received this information uh, from the teachings of Jesus, but also uh, probably there was special revelation given to him as well directly from the Lord. So this isn't something Paul just made up. He got this directly from the Lord, and it's a precious truth for us. I right. think that's a particularly important, John, because the fact is a lot of Christians today say that it's a man-made doctrine. Yeah. But this text tells us this came straight from the Lord. Mm -hmm. All right, so what did he say? I mean, here's the big one. You the Lord Himself. Take it from there. Well, the Lord Himself will descend from heaven. So you have the return of Christ, and yet He describes it as He's coming in the clouds to call the believers up to heaven, to the clouds, to the Father's house, presumably, to meet with Him there. So you have the promise of the return of Christ. You have the promise of the resurrection of the dead believers. You have the promise of the rapture of living believers. All of those concepts, resurrection, return, and rapture are all combined in this one promise in this one passage. And Mark, he gives the order. He says, first of all, when he shouts and he descends to the air, the fact is the dead in Christ rise first. Right. Okay. And so they take off, but then we and I love that. Again, Paul includes himself. So he was expecting this in his lifetime. We will also join them and go up to meet the Lord in the air. That's right. You, whenever the Lord comes back, this is a very simple point, but people are going to be in one of two conditions. Believers, they either will have died or they'll be alive. Right. If they've died, then their body will be resurrected, rejoined with their perfected spirit. That body will be an incorruptible, imperishable uh, body. Uh, but then the people who are alive on the earth when the Lord comes are going to be caught up immediately to be with the Lord. And that's where we get that word rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, we'll be caught up. And a lot of people, you know, say the word rapture is not in the Bible, but, but the Greek word there, the, it's a Greek word harpazo, means uh, to be caught up or to be snatched or to be seized. And so those who are alive are going to go an instantaneous, undergo an instantaneous transformation. Yeah. Again, they're going to receive an incorruptible, imperishable, um, eternal body in, in a moment of time. Yeah, and let's track that a little bit because people do say, hey, where do you find the doctrine of the rapture in the Bible? And it's there, but it's in the Greek word harpazo. But uh, when they translated the Bible into Latin, what happened, Ron? Well, they used a word, uh, raptus, which comes from another word, rapere. Mm -hmm. And that's where we get the word rapture. And it le yeah. means literally to, to snatch up or to seize. It actually means to forcefully seize. And so this is not going to be some kind of a kind and gentle, gentle catching up to be with the Lord in the air, but rather it's going to be a forceful snatching by the Lord of His people up into the air. Yeah. Now, this, this whole thing of um, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord, not in Boston, <laughs> but in the air. Talk about that. Well, I think that's important in the whole concept of this passage. This is a coming of the Lord in the air, in the clouds, 
to catch the bride of Christ up to heaven to the Father's house. He's not at this point coming to the earth. He doesn't touch the earth. They're caught up in the air. So this idea of the rapture is not unique just to this passage. Uh, Enoch was raptured. Elijah was raptured. You have raptures throughout the Bible. You have the two witnesses raptured up in the book of Revelation. It's not only taught here. It's really a concept taught throughout Scripture that the Lord has such a plan and a purpose for a person's ultimate destiny. He's coming not only for your spirit, but for your body as well. So two things, Ed. One, every Christian reading their Bible has to admit there's going to be the rapture that is going to happen, okay? It's, it's in the Bible, okay? Number two, when we read all of the information about prophecy of Christ's second coming, there seems to be two phases of His coming back. What are they? Well, the catching up to heaven and the return to earth. What has to happen when we're caught up to heaven? What will happen when we return to earth with Him? Yeah, and when we look at the information, the reason we say there's two phases to this, separated by a period of judgment of certain years here, is, for example, we're told about the rapture, Christ comes in the air and we meet, meet Him. At the second coming, Christ comes to the earth. At the rapture, Christ comes for His saints. And in the second coming, Christ comes with His saints. At the rapture, believers depart from the earth. At the second coming, unbelievers are taken away from the earth. At the rapture, Christ claims His bride. At the second coming, Christ comes with His bride. At the rapture, there are no signs. It's an imminent event, which we're going to see from other verses. At the second coming, it's preceded by a ton of signs that we're going to look at in Matthew 24. The rapture will occur in a moment in the time it takes to blink an eye and only His own will see Him. Whereas at the second coming, He'll be visible to the entire world and every eye shall see Him. After the rapture, the tribulation begins. And after the second coming, the millennium begins. Now, these are just a few and we're going to take another program. We're going to really develop those further. But just those differences tell us we got two phases of Christ coming back. Yeah, there are too many things for all of that to happen in one event. That's exactly it's right. It's obvious it's got to be two. Right. But in spite of this, Christians hold to different views about when the rapture is going to take place and what it is. And so we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the different views that people hold about this. Folks, you won't want to miss this. Stick with us. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, the Biblical Case for the Rapture of All Christians. The three programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of only $49. And you may order this series now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. All right, we're back. We're talking with Dr. Ed Heinsen, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, and Dr. Ron Rhodes about the rapture and the second coming. And there are four views that are held in the church about the rapture, and we want to talk about those. First of all, is that the rapture happens before the tribulation. It's called pre-tribulation view. What is it? It literally means that Jesus will come in the rapture before the time of tribulation and judgment. Uh, the church will be caught away to the Father's house before He unleashes the judgments that are described in the book of the Revelation. Uh, pre-trib then believes in an imminent rapture. It could happen at any moment, at any time. Keep watching for me to come, keep waiting for me to come, keep an eye on the sky. Jesus could come back at any moment. Yeah. Ron, there's a second position of people that say, you've got the rapture in the Bible, but I think it's in a different spot. There is going to be a tribulation, but we're going to put the rapture right in the middle. Okay, it's called the mid-tribulation view. What is the mid-tribulation view? Well, the tribulation is seven years in length. We see that from Daniel 9, 27. So the mid-trib view would be that the, the rapture takes place three and a half years into the tribulation. And so what they will say is that the wrath of God falls in the second half and the church is going to be raptured before that. The problem, of course, with that is that Scripture indicates that the entire tribulation period will be characterized by God's wrath. I'm thinking, for example, of Revelation 3.10 which says that the church will be delivered from the hour of trial, the actual time period of the tribulation. The whole time period. The entire time period. 
Now typically what they'll try to argue is they'll compare the trumpets in 1 Corinthians 15 with the trumpet in Revelation 11:15, And you've got the seventh trumpet and the last trumpet. And since the seventh trumpet in Revelation, you know, takes place in the middle of the tribulation, why that must mean that the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15 must take place at the midpoint of the tribulation. The problem with that is that these are two entirely different contexts. When you look at the book of Revelation, the trumpet unleashes the seven bowl judgments. It unleashes the wrath of God, whereas in 1 Corinthians 15, the trumpet has to do with the rapture, the catching up of the saints to meet the Lord in the air. And if you continue your study of trumpets, which I have, you'll see that trumpets are often used in a whole variety of different ways in the Bible. And so that's really an illegitimate uh, way to argue for the mid-trip position. And when you take a literal approach to the trumpets, to the wrath of God, to the hour of trial from which the church will be delivered, you can't come out mid-trib. The pre-tribulational view is the only one that fits with a literal interpretation of the rapture. Dr. Mark Hitchcock, there's another one that's close, but not exactly the same. It's called the pre-wrath view. What's the difference between that and the mid-tribulation view? Well, the pre-wrath view is really the newest, really, of these various views, and basically it's kind of a three-quarter rapture position. They believe that the rapture will happen about five and a half years into the seven-year tribulation, and they place the rapture of the church between the sixth and seventh seal judgments there in Revelation chapter 6. And so what they basically say is, is that the first five and a half years of the tribulation is not God's wrath. It's the wrath of man. Um, it's the wrath of Satan. And that God's wrath is kind of compressed just into that last quarter uh, of the tribulation period. So we will be raptured or caught up uh, before that period of time. A couple of problems with that, though, I think scripturally are that the wrath of God seems to begin at the very beginning of the tribulation. Yeah, you have Jesus, these seal judgments. Jesus are, opens up the seals. Yeah, and Jesus is the Lamb. He's opening these seals. And you have the, the first four seal judgments that are opened. They're often called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And uh, while those are, are war and famine and, and various things like that, they're still being uh, directed and unleashed uh, by the Lord Himself. And so to say that the wrath is just at the end, I think goes against uh, the, what we see in Revelation chapter 6. Another problem is in 1 Thessalonians 5, it tells us when the day of the Lord comes, and that's a, a synonym, I believe, for the tribulation mm -hmm. period, the people are going to be saying peace and safety. Well, it seems odd when you get to the, between the sixth, uh, sixth and seventh seal judgments for people to be saying peace and safety at that time. You've already been through these first five seals. Just in the fourth seal alone, a fourth of the earth dies. And so it seems very strange that people would be saying peace and safety at a time like that. So those, those two passages, I think, would, would argue against the, the plausibility of the, this pre-wrath rapture view. Yeah. And Ed, one more, and that is the post-tribulation view. Tell us what it is. Yeah, in that view, the rapture takes place post, after the time of tribulation. Uh, so they view a time of tribulation coming, usually as seven years. They view a rapture coming, but to put the rapture at the end of the time of tribulation, often saying things like, well, the church has always suffered persecution. Why would we expect to suffer and miss persecution at the time of these judgments, etc.? But there's a huge difference between persecution uh, and the divine wrath of God. The wrath of God is poured out in the book of Revelation. Uh, and what you're really saying is that the bride of Christ is going to suffer the wrath of Christ, who opens the seals, the wrath of God, who pours out the bold judgments, uh, and yet somehow the bride is going to survive until the very end. Uh, it's like beat up the bride and get her ready for eternity. To me, that's like Protestant purgatory. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's clear Jesus took the wrath for us on the cross. When He died in our place, the punishment against our sin was upon Him on the cross. We deserve the wrath, but we won't receive the wrath because Jesus took the wrath of God for us. You know, right in keeping with that, Ed, is 1 Thessalonians 4.18, which talks about, therefore encourage each other with these words. The post-trib view just doesn't fit with that. The church is going to go through the tribulation, through the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments, and through Armageddon, therefore encourage each other with these words. Yeah, I mean, I think of all these views, if you, know, if you get to the midpoint of the tribulation, some scholars have calculated that you got a billion people that have died yes. through the calamities. So peace and safety is not there at that spot. 
And we're going to talk about other verses in the Bible that actually talk about this and say Jesus is going to keep us from all of that. He's going to rescue us from all of that. All right, Ed, let's review what we've talked about today. Why is this topic about the rapture so important? Because it's the one topic that gives hope and comfort to the believer. The three of us have studied this, researched it, debated it, discussed it, and wrestled through these things for nearly 40 years or more each. We are convinced this is what the Bible teaches. When Paul said, therefore, comfort one another with these words, there has to be a word of comfort, uh, of encouragement for the believer because he believes Jesus could come potentially at any time. Uh, I was sitting in a church where a friend of mine did not believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. He preached his whole sermon and said, so you see, there never will be a rapture which he knows is not true. There has to be one. He just puts it at a different point in time. And when he ended, he said, we have nothing to look forward to but trouble, trouble, and more trouble. And the people in his own church moaned right out loud. <laughs> I was tempted to stand up in the back and shout, wherefore comfort one another with those words. Uh, but I didn't. But I talked to him afterwards and I said, Wilson, you know there has to be a rapture. You and I simply disagree on where to put it. But my view is the word of comfort and encouragement. What else, Mark? Well, the, the rapture is a very motivating hope for us. It gives us strength. At the end of talking about the rapture in 1 Corinthians, uh, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your labor is not in vain. So it's a motivating hope. It's, it gives us an incentive uh, to live and to labor for the Lord. And it's also a purifying hope. In uh, 1 John uh, chapter uh, 3, the Lord tells us, Everyone who fixes his hope on him purifies himself even as He Himself is pure. You can't live your life and believe that Jesus could come back at any moment and be living a life that, that, that's sinful and that's uh, against God's will. Those two are incompatible. It's a hope that purifies us in our life and uh, calls us uh, higher in, in our living for the Lord. And so it, it, when people say that, you know, this doctrine of the rapture, you know, it's just kind of pie in the sky. It's just kind of something that's future. It doesn't relate to everyday life. Almost every place in the Bible where you have a statement of the Lord's coming, there's practical application of how we live in the here and now. Yeah, I was thinking about James. He says, you know, don't even grumble because the judge is standing right at the door. Right. He's ready yes. to come. Ryan, what else? The Apostle Paul said that he didn't want the Thessalonians to be ignorant about those who are asleep in Christ. It's not okay to be ignorant about the rapture. And the way not to be ignorant is to understand the Word of God. And the way to understand the Word of God is to take the words as they were intended to be taken with a literal approach. Just as we interpret those first coming prophecies literally, so we interpret the rapture passages and all the other end time passages quite literally. Yeah. You know, according to the verse we looked in 1 Thessalonians today, the fact is, is that when Jesus raptures all the Christians out of here, the unbelievers are left. Mm. For people that say, I'm not a believer in Jesus and I don't want to be left, I don't want to go through the tribulation, how can you make sure you're going, Ed? You need to know for sure that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that He rose from the dead, and that He's coming again. Uh, you need to know that with confidence in your heart and mind, not to say, I hope I'm going to make it. Uh, salvation is not a hope so issue. Uh, the Scripture says these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. It's the assurance of knowing Jesus died in my place, shed His blood for my sins, rose from the dead on my behalf, I'm putting my trust in my eternal destiny in what He did for me on the cross. That kind of assurance gives you the assurance that I can look forward to the coming of Christ. Bible prophecy is not written to scare us. Bible prophecy is written to prepare us. Come to Christ while there's hope, while there's time. This is a great word, folks. And I'm just saying next week we're going to continue. We're going to build these passages of Scripture. I want you to see what the Bible says. And these guys are going to present it very clearly. We're going to take another, the second major passage about the rapture. So I hope that you'll join us then. If you'd like to have all of the information in our new series, The Biblical Case for the Rapture of All Christians, the three programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of only $49. You will learn how millions of Christians will suddenly be missing from the earth to meet Jesus in the air and be taken to heaven. 
and why the power of world leadership will shift away from the United States to the European continent. We're also offering a second series called The Five Great Events of the End Times, which answers the questions, when does the tribulation start? Which nations come against Israel? When will the Antichrist be revealed? What is the mark of the beast? Will America be involved in the Battle of Armageddon? The three important programs in this series are also available for a gift of $49. And finally, we are also offering our new book entitled, The Most Asked Prophecy Questions, What the Bible Says About End Times and Why It Matters Today. This 121-page book contains concise biblical answers to 78 prophecy questions I asked the late Dr. Renal Showers during a private 14-hour TV discussion. Most prophecy scholars who knew this professor loved listening to his in-depth study of a lifetime filled with scholarly study of biblical prophecy. This is a timely book, and you may order it now for a gift of $15. But then today, if you wish to have both DVDs and our new book, you may order them for a gift of $100. And you may order them now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. Or if you wish, you may give your gift at our website at jashow.org where we have a secure place for you to give your gift. That's jashow.org. And then, for those of you who live in Canada, you may call us at 1-866-746-5803. That's 1-866-746-5803. And our Canadian website is jashow.ca. And when we receive your gift, we'll send you a receipt and a personal thank you. Finally, keep in mind that all of our TV programs are available online as digital downloads at our website at jashow.org or jashow.ca. Our goal is to present the evidence for the gospel worldwide and to encourage Christians in their walk with the Lord. This program is sponsored by the John Ankerberg Show Ministries and is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.